morning, we're going to be doing something a little bit different as we uh, look to kick off, uh, continue, continue with our missions month here at the Bridge Church. Uh, we're trying to do everything we can to become more missions focused as a church. And when I talk about missions, I talk about any efforts that we support outside of these walls of the Bridge Church. And, and specifically, within our context, we support four different efforts that are described by the words here, near, far, and hard. And I'm going to get more into, get, get more into detail about what the meaning of those words are. But uh, this morning, we have the privilege of actually having our, our, our uh, near effort uh, with us to share uh, their ministry and what they are doing. And uh, it's near and dear to my heart because it's actually my mother's ministry called Jericho Outreach Ministries. And so uh, we're actually going to go ahead and give them a hand as they come forward to share with us this morning. Can we do that? Good stuff. All right. All right. Who, are you going to take it this time? First service, she's like, I'm not touching that microphone, Rob. So uh, uh, this is a, a ministry that is our near effort, okay? We have a here effort, a near effort, a far effort, and a hard effort that we support. Um, uh, and that's our missions model. And uh, a couple of years ago, our missions committee was meeting. And uh, uh, Steph, they, they began talking about my mother's ministry. And... Uh, uh, Without Steph and I's uh, uh, efforts, they said, well, why aren't we supporting them as a church? And, uh, and so uh, we graciously said, okay, yeah, but if that's what you want to do, uh, let's do it. And uh, this is a ministry down in Des Moines, Iowa, if you didn't pick it up on the video. Um, my mother and, and, and a lot of the, they, they call them the church ladies, okay, uh, go to a number of adult inter entertainment clubs throughout Des Moines, Iowa, and they minister to the women there. They minister to the dancers, they minister to the people in the clubs, they minister to the bouncers, um, and they, they, they pray with them, they bring snacks to them, they do um, all these amazing things uh, where they are reaching out to the least of these in a number of different regards. And uh, it, it, it's a matter of pride and joy for me to be able to share with you guys this morning, so I'm going to have to repent later about this, but um, I'm just so thankful that you guys were able to make it up to share with us this morning, and we want to do everything we can to support you. So uh, in order to do that, I think we really need to know know uh, kind of your story mom this is my mother Laura uh, this is Stephanie uh, one of the one of the members and then this is Cindy as well Cindy has known me since I was in diapers so uh, it, she's pretty near and dear to our hearts but uh, I'll go ahead and let you kind of share the story mom if that's all right with you go ahead and introduce yourself again and then uh, kind of tell us hey how did this ministry get started and what did God do in your life that, that you know got you guys going with this thing and and, and where are you at now First of all, thank you for having us this morning, and it's an honor and a privilege to talk about what God is doing. <laughs> um, five years ago in August, <coughs> excuse me, I was at a women at women of faith conference. Maybe some of you are familiar with those, and Cindy was with me. And one of the speakers happened to be talking about a woman in his church who was doing this really radical ministry, and she was going into the local strip clubs in Louisville, Kentucky, and taking meals to the dancers and the staff. And by doing that, she was able to build relationships and begin sharing Christ with them. And my friend Cindy said, you, did you hear that? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and But she really meant was, you should do this, not her. Because um, <laughs> she knows my love for cooking and the way I love to love people through my cooking. Time out, time out. Y'all, my mama can cook, okay? <laughs> Just, let's just, you want to talk about gifts that the Lord's placed on people. This woman can cook. Okay, go ahead. That's so, how I got my girlish figure. I began praying about it and I said, God, if this is something you really want me to do, I need to know that it's a calling from you and it's not just something I'm interested in. Because if it's just something you're interested in or you're just feeling a need somewhere, then you're going to burn out and lose it and lose interest. And these women deserve more than that. So... <clears throat> began praying about it within two or three weeks I had gotten hold we found out that a couple in our church their son attended the church that the speaker was from in Louisville Kentucky from there we got the name of the church got in contact with them they sent us tickets to their big fundraiser that they have every year and with and about four or five weeks after that Cindy and I were on our way to Louisville Kentucky we visited the ministry we visited the church got to know some of the girls that were coming out of the clubs and our hearts just broke and we knew got back to des moines and rachel said yeah can i come alongside you guys and do this and we're like yeah but cindy still didn't want to go and i'll let her share that in a minute 
But ever since then, we start off parking off the property of the clubs and just praying over the property, praying over the people inside. And then we got a little braver and God pushed us onto the parking lot. And that changed a lot of things because then we could see the faces of the people. And we knew there's a story there. When you see an 80 year old man hunched over with his cane hobbling into a club, you wonder what the story is there. Um, and so that began to break our hearts and different things happened within that first year that really just got us ready. Next thing we knew, we were inside talking to the, girls, to the door girls in the lobby, and now there's five clubs in Des Moines. Three of them we can walk anywhere we want to pretty much to talk to whoever we want to. Um, just the fact that the owners and managers let us in, is that a God thing or what? <laughs> yeah. And then, um, so three of them we can walk anywhere we want to. One, we're inside of the lobby, and if girls come out to talk to us, we're able to talk to them, and we can talk to the door girl and the bouncers. And the fifth one, there was a misunderstanding a few years ago and we haven't been allowed back, but we still stop on that property every week, park in the parking lot and just pray over the people inside. That's amazing. That's really cool. So, um, so they, they started this ministry a little before I came to Charles City, and since then it's come quite, quite a long ways. And uh, you guys have had some crazy stories along the way. So I'm going to ask you to give the microphone to Cindy. And, uh, and, and Cindy, we would just like to hear, um, well, why don't we do that? Why don't you share a different story about how God kind of worked in your heart and said, hey, I'm supposed to be doing this, uh, not just be pushing Laura to do it. So, Yeah, I, I was support. I just, I, my friend wanted to do something and I was, went to support her and she was like, do you want to do this? And I'm like, uh, uh, that's Satan's ground and that means he's going to attack and it's not going to be pretty. And I worked so hard to get back where I was and in my good graces with God and, and you know, I was just stressing about it and I was like, I don't know. I just kept going back and forth and Stephanie, your pastor's wife, uh, and I were talking one day and I was like, you know, I just don't know if I want to do this. And she said, well, what are you scared of? What about the blessings? And what about the, I mean, and I didn't do this just for blessings, but it got me to thinking, wow, he is bigger than that. God is bigger than all that ick. He is stronger than all of that. He will protect me. What am I worried about? He's bigger than that. And um, so I was like, all right, let's try it. You know, <laughs> let's do this and we'll see what happens. And, and I agree with Laura, you know, in the beginning we were all, man, just burn it down, you know, or, <laughs> you know, we, we, don't want, we don't want this to be around anymore, Lord, just knock it all out. You know, that was our prayer. And as she said, when we got closer to the, to the, doors and we could see the girls you know my mama bear instinct in me was like I'm gonna yank them out of there and but you know what just like me God couldn't just yank me out I, it has to be a decision and it has to be a choice so that's where we just began to do build relationships with these girls and get to know them and just share how God worked in our own lives um, with them good stuff that's awesome the so, whole thing is just to share and show the love of Christ in the yep. adult entertainment industry. Absolutely. So you started praying off the property, then you get on the property and we're praying over it. Then I remember you telling me a story one time, Cindy, about how you, the first time you laid your hand on the building and prayed over the building. And yeah, then, well, kind of on the building. It was more like towards the building. Okay. <laughs> we weren't quite on the building yet. Um, okay. Yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was a freaky night. Gotcha, that was a yeah, freaky night. Absolutely. Freaky and night. then... And now you're inside of the clubs and you're building relationships with so many people yeah. and, and God's using you guys in some in pretty incredible ways. And one of those incredible ways is sitting right among us this morning. Uh, and so, Stephanie, we would love for you to share your story with us and how God's impacted you and, and kind of taken over your life in, in a number of different ways. All right. Well, hello. My name is Stephanie and um, I was actually inside of the clubs. Uh, I had been working for five years, and it was a pretty gradual process, but I had just grown to um, hate it. I hated my job, I hated waking up, I hated what I had to do. Um, I got pretty hopeless, and uh, my soul got pretty weary, um, and I wasn't sure how to get out of it, how to overcome the situation. I really didn't know what to do, I didn't have a clue. And these ladies sitting next to me would come into the clubs every Tuesday night. 
not once a month, not every once in a while. Every single Tuesday, these ladies would come in and they would bring snacks and fruit trays and food and blankets and they would sit and talk and they would ask for prayer requests and they would just sit and listen and um, how genuine they were about what, I, what was going on in my life and how I felt was just something that's, it's indescribable. And uh, so I was, I was wanting to get out of the club for quite a while and finally one night I decided to reach out to them and ask for a prayer request on that um, and to show me how. And it wasn't, it was about six months after that I had actually gotten the strength to get out of the club uh, and they still, and uh, so I was out of the club and I was really struggling to try to transition into a different lifestyle. It was really rough and these ladies kept calling me, hey, how are you? How are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm good. But why are you calling me? I'm not in the club anymore. I don't work there anymore. You can, you can go back to doing your thing. You know, don't worry about me. I'll be all right. No, nope. they would call me all the time. Hey, how are you feeling? Do you need a ride? Are you hungry? Would you like to eat? The answer is yes. She really can cook, guys. And so it was a really slow thing. She would just give me rides, and then I would come over and eat in the middle of the night. We have the same sleep schedule, so that works out. And uh, they just showed me how to pray and how to look to God, and they gave me my first Bible which was amazing. I love it. It's one of my most cherished possessions. And um, they start a Bible study group so that I can um, interact with them and ask questions if I need to. And it's just been an amazing journey. Amen. That's awesome. That's awesome. Praise God. Very cool. So, oh, go ahead. The video you saw before we came up, there's a woman being baptized at the end of it, and that's Stephanie. Amen. That's awesome. Praise God. Very cool. So God's doing huge things. God's doing great things, like we say, like we like we sang about. Amen. And um, uh, so you guys have got a Bible study started now, and things are going really well. And you've got not only Stephanie there, but a few other girls that you know are still in the in the clubs and and, and working out their one faith. One or two and, that aren't, and a couple that still are. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Stephanie's got a little bit of a funny story about something that she kind of got angry about when she was reading her Bible. So I'm going to let her share that with you guys. All right. Okay. So uh, I did not grow up in a Christian household. I wasn't really familiar with the word Bible. I had never read it before. And we were in John 6. And that is the story when um, Jesus provides and he makes, he feeds 5,000 men with just a little piece of bread and then had leftovers. And so it was just such a, a, an awe thing for me to imagine Jesus having this little scrap and being able to provide for such an enormous amount of people and in such abundance. And as soon as we got done with that part, then it said, well, so then he went off to pray, be with God, and the people were looking for him. They couldn't find him, so they left him. Who would leave Jesus? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Amen. So, yeah, so... Don't leave Jesus, y'all. All right? <laughs> like, y'all need Jesus. We all need Jesus. Don't be walking away from him. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So, yeah. So, uh, just uh, just an amazing testimony, an amazing story from y'all. And, and and honestly, you sit there and you talk about the scrap of bread. And, and I imagine I, the thing that kind of was brought to my mind was, I know where my mom was at when she started this ministry. And let me tell you, she felt like a scrap of bread. She felt like, man, I'm not sure if we can do this. This is going to take a huge leap of faith. And Cindy was the same way. Uh, that's why she doubted so much. And, and God multiplied it. Amen? Amen? I mean, he's using it and he's using them. And uh, he wants to use you too. And uh, if you're here this morning and you would say, man, I, I don't feel adequate. That's okay. You don't have to be. God already is. And he's going to help carry you through that. So um, uh, we just we want to give you guys a hand and just thank you for coming. And... Uh, 
Stephanie, I asked you this first service, but I want to ask you again just so that these, all these people in second service know how to pray for you as well. But we're, we're just so thankful for what God's doing in your life. And it's, it's just so incredible and amazing. And what we would love to, to hear is how we can continue to pray for you because the battle's not over and everybody knows that. It's just begun. Um, and so what can we do to pray for you? And then, Mom, you know what? Maybe won't we have you share a prayer request as well for the ministry. Is that all right? All right. Go ahead, Stephanie. Okay, um, so this is the second time sharing my story, so uh, really new, I'm really nervous, but I guess my prayer request would be when you're doing great things for the glory of God, the enemy knows that, and he tries to stop that and attack you, and so the spiritual warfare that I am facing going through, um, I just ask for strength and courage to be able to stand up and share my story and um, tell it with confidence and pride in just to let everybody know how great God is and just to be able to share that and help others. That's awesome. That's awesome. We can absolutely do that. How about that? Praying for boldness. That's all she wants. I, I think that's exactly what the apostles prayed for in the book of Acts and, and that's what we need to pray for daily. So that's awesome. And what I love watching Stephanie do is talk to the, some of the other girls in Bible study who are not out of the clubs yet and, well, I have to do this to be able to afford this. She goes, I know it doesn't make sense, but you just got to learn to trust God. She goes, I didn't believe it either. Never thought of how it could work. But I tr just, just trust God. But that's it. Trust that's right. God. That's right. <laughs> it's so neat to watch her share her faith with the other girls too. Uh, for Jericho Outreach Ministries, there's uh, things are really beginning to explode. Like you said, we have the Bible study going. We um, Christmas is coming up, so we're putting together the Christmas bags. We've teamed a, a team, a radio local Christian radio station teamed up with this year, this year to help us with that. And at a Big Daddy Weave concert on Friday, they were asking people to bring bathrobes for the women and we they collected over 206 and if you could see the picture of these mounds of bathrobes all over this room that were donated that was beautiful um, but as we go forward we are looking for possibly a man not don't, no you're not going to the club um, sorry dad <laughs> We have some of the men in the clubs who are bouncers or um, mainly bouncers or DJs that are looking for a Bible study. And it's just not appropriate for them to be in the same group as the women. So we want a man who will be willing to start that with another partner hmm. and uh, lead those men towards God. And also as we move forward, we need a place. <laughs> it's outgrowing my house, ask my husband. Um, and so we've decided that a portion of everything that's given to us through donations will be set aside into an account to be purchasing a home soon where we can still have our Bible study, still have the kitchen to cook in. And if a woman is coming out of a situation where she needs temporary housing until she's able to get on her feet or until she gets to a trafficking recovery house, then we'd be able to keep her there for a couple, for as long as she needed during that time. Yeah. And then as Stephanie said, the enemy is on the prowl. And he attacks us all in different ways. And sometimes, and when we first started, Rachel and Cindy and I each identified our weak spots and where Satan would come at us, and he did. But then he got tricky and sneaky once we realized that and tried to come between us. And that took a little longer to recognize, and it was rough. And so we don't always know how he's going to come at us, but we need to be prepared. So we just, the best way that you guys can help us in preparation for that is prayer over Jericho Ministries. Amen. You guys know something about prayer, don't you? Absolutely. Uh, that was amazing. Well, why don't we just uh, go ahead and, and bow our heads and pray for them in this moment. Heavenly Father, um, I thank you for just an incredible testimony of what you're doing um, in Des Moines, Lord. Uh, specifically, uh, just how proud I can be as a son of what my uh, my mother and, and practically my Aunt Cindy are doing, along with so many other wonderful women, Lord. I, I pray a blessing over Stephanie, God. What an incredible story, and, and, and we know that you want to use her to do so much more. And, and what I appreciate the most about her story is how she's been made a disciple that wants to make more disciples. That is, that is what we're called to do. We're called to connect people to you, Lord, each and every day in every way that we can. Um, we're not here to be seat warmers on Sundays. 
We're here to minister your gospel and share it to others. And, and I pray that this ministry never loses sight of that. that our people would never lose sight of that. And so, Lord, I, I pray for boldness for all of these women, including Stephanie, that they would just continue in faith. Uh, uh, know that you're going to be with them and, and that you're going to take care of them. And it doesn't mean that there aren't going to be missteps and there aren't going to be mishaps and there aren't going to be trials and troubles. But, God, there's definitely a transcendent peace that comes across us when we uh, witness it. Uh, when we step out in faith and encourage. And so, God, we just pray for that. And we just pray for uh, this new home and all of the vision uh, that you've given them. Uh, if you've given them this vision, then it will be accomplished. And so, Lord, we just pray uh, that you would help us as a church to come around them through prayer, petitioning, finance, and whatever it may be, Lord. We love you and we thank you and we praise you and we pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Can we give them another hand as they, they step off? Well, this week we're kicking off our, our mission series called Pray, Send, Go. Last week we kicked off Missions Month, and this week we're kicking off the series. And uh, this morning we're going to be doing something a little bit different, and I'll let you know what that is in a few minutes here. Um, but as we kick off this new series called Pray, Send, Go, you need to know that throughout this sermon series, our focus will be in the area of missions, okay? Ministry work that we support outside of the boundaries of our church, town, county, state, and even our country. Each week, our goal is to highlight each and every mission that we support as a church and that it become, is a focal, focal point for us. And not only that, we want to provide you with opportunities to dive deeper into those efforts as well. We've given you a number of ways to be generous over the last month, whether that be through the Christmas boxes for Samaritan's Purse. Hey, don't forget to turn in your box before Monday or, or by Monday. Uh, uh, we, we gave you the opportunity to help out with Truck or Treat, which is a huge outreach for our community. We gave you the opportunity to send our team from here Houston, it's down to Houston, Texas to do some awesome work down there. Raise your hand if you're in Texas. Come on. We got one. Okay, we got one. Everybody else went to first service. So they got in. They got in late last night, and so probably, I don't think half of them made it to service, but that's great. Um, uh, they had a great, great time, and they just want to thank you for everything that you did. And we're going we're gonna to debrief with them next week, okay, Larry? And that's the plan. But um, uh, we just, we've given you all these opportunities, and we're going to give you more over the next month. Um, one way that you can support Jericho is definitely through prayer, um, but then you can also go to their, their webpage, which is jerichooutreachministries.org. Okay, if you want more information, you can see them at the table as you walk out um, this morning morning. But uh, the whole point of this series is to be uh, a missions focused. We want to, we want to be more missions. We want to elevate the missions awareness of our church. But here's the thing. This series isn't just about missions awareness. It's also about self-awareness because we want you by the end of this month to be asking this question. How invested am I in the world around my world? Can we just read that together? How invested am I in the world around my world? Our missions model here at the bridge looks something like this. Here, near, far, and hard. And I said that earlier. Here, near, far, and hard. We have an effort along all, three of, all four of these words that are described by all four of these words that we um, actually give 5% of our budget to annually um, to support a, a missions effort. Our, our, as, a, as a part of the Wesleyan denomination, we're required as a church to take 10% of our general fund and tithe it to that denomination. We have an incredible denomination with great backing that's done a lot to make it even possible for us to meet here today. And so we want to do everything we can to tithe just like you tithe of, your, uh, of what God gives you. Our church tithes to our denomination as well. But then, above and beyond that, we give 5% to these four different efforts. Now, what I want you to know is I'd like to see that amount increase each year. I'd like to see us get to the point where we're giving 10% of our general tithes and offerings to missions efforts outside of, of, of uh, just giving to our denomination. Um, but the four efforts that we support uh, that we're going to be highlighting over the next three weeks are, firstly, uh, Cedar Springs Camp and Retreat. Many of you know about this ministry. Mark and Teresa Jenkins are the directors of that camp, just here, about 20 minutes north of us here in Floyd, and uh, we're super thankful for them. Many of you may not know this, but Mark was actually a big part of the leadership team that got the Bridge Church off the ground, and we're thankful for his support. And we, I told him what, what, what has blessed my heart so much is I told Mark when he was helping us get the Bridge Church off the ground, I said, man, 
I, I, I give you my word, we're going to be pouring right back into you guys. It's going to happen. And, and we're finally at that point where we're doing that. It's just, it's just amazing. The second effort that we support is Jericho Outreach Ministries. They are near to us. They're only down in Des Moines, Iowa. They're about two hours away. And we're just thankful for uh, being able to support them. We also support a missionary in Japan. Um, did you guys know that less than 1% of people in Japan even know who Jesus Christ is? Of the millions and millions of people that live in Japan, only uh, less than 1% know the gospel and have claimed to, to, to submit their lives over to Jesus Christ. And then we also support an effort. It's, it's a hard effort. And the reason it's described as hard is because Josh and Christina Carter are with the Aaliyah people. Now, the Aaliyah people, the, you guys are going, who are the Aaliyah people? Well, that's just a funny name that they give them because they can't describe where they're at because if they were um, caught in the country that they were, they would be martyred for their faith. They are in a persecuted country where they can lose their lives for sharing Jesus Christ with other people. So we support this effort as well. And uh, we're excited when Josh and Christina come, come, come to visit us. They came to visit us last year, and it was an awesome time to just be able to really hear about exactly where they're at and what they're doing. But for the sake of their safety, um, we, do not, we, we will not share that with you this morning. If you want to come and ask me personally, I can tell you um, where they are at as missionaries. But as we kick off this series, all I, I, all I can think about is, man, man, we need to be really serious about the, the, the world around our world, okay? If there's, any, if there's any problem with North America right now, it's that we lack understanding for those that are not like us, amen? We seriously lack understanding for those that are not like us, and really what it comes down to is we lack compassion. We lack compassion. We need to figure out, do all that we can to have more compassion for others, for our communities, for our towns, for the people around us that aren't like us. If there's anything in North America right now that, that I struggle with more than anything, it's the ugliness that goes on when someone disagrees with another, another individual. There's no understanding. There's no compassion. There's no love. And the question that kind of landed on my heart this morning when I was talking in first service was... Um, I, when you see someone that doesn't love Jesus or isn't following God or is, or is doing horrible things, is your first inclination to get angry or to be broken? Is your first inclination to be angry with them or to be broken for them? Because Jesus was broken for people, wasn't he? He was broken for the least of these. He, he was the model of compassion. Compassion literally means come, which means with, Okay, and then passion, which means a deep feeling or emotion. Literally, compassion was understood to mean sharing of affliction with one another. Sharing of affliction with one another. Compassion is the core of who we are as a human race. It's what separates us from the rest of creation. It's just one of the many things that are placed inside of us with the Imago Dei, the image of God. When God created humanity, when he created you, he placed in you a number of very unique things. The highest of which was the ability to be compassionate rather than simply instinctual. A man by the name of Arthur Schopenhauer believed this so much that he said, compassion is the basis of morality. It's the basis of who we are as a human race and who we are to become. We all know that Jesus was the model of compassion. I've talked about that a little bit already. But do you know how many times in the Bible it literally says Jesus had compassion on them? In Matthew 20, it says Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. He healed them. In Matthew uh, 14, it said Jesus had compassion on them and healed their sick. In Matthew 15, it said Jesus had compassion on them and fed them. In Mark 6, it said, Jesus had compassion on them and began teaching them. And in Luke 15, I don't know how many of you know the story of the prodigal son. It's a beautiful picture of God's love for us. Did you know what, the, what, what it said about the father as he ran to back to the prodigal son? If you don't know the story of the prodigal son, it's the story about how these two, little, these two sons were, were, there was a good son and quote unquote a bad son. Right? And during that time to receive your father's inheritance was a big deal when he passed away. But one son up approached his father and said, I want my inheritance now. You don't even got to die. Just give me my stuff. 
just give me my stuff now. And he, and, and he took it, and the father gave it to him, which, which some of us are going, what was wrong with that dad, right? <laughs> Wasn't he more disciplined, that selfish little brat? But he gave the son all of his, uh, his inheritance, and the son ran away, and he squandered it, the Bible said. And at one point, this son is literally in, in, in slums with pigs as the lowliest of servants, and he realizes, I need to run back to my father because the life that I could have with him is way better than what I've got now, even if I'm a bond servant. And so he goes back to his father. And this is what it says in Luke 15. The father had, what is it? Compassion. The Father had compassion on him. And you get this beautiful imagery because the Father didn't just have compassion. He ran to him. He threw his arms around him and he kissed him. I don't know about you guys, but that gives me goosebumps when I think about my own situation. When I think about Stephanie's situation. When I think about my wife's situation. When I think about... Um, your situations. You may be here today and, and you may not know who Christ is. You may feel like a messed up individual. You may feel like, man, God couldn't save me. But let me tell you, the prodigal son was just as messed up as you are. I was just as messed up as you are. There are tons of people in this congregation this morning that were just as messed up as you are, if not worse. And the Father ran to us. The Father ran to us and threw his arms around us. And he wants to do the same for you this morning. When Jesus, um, as we look at all the things that Jesus did when he had compassion on people, we see three major things that he did. First of all, he healed the sick. Second of all, he preached hope to them. And lastly, he did everything he could to care for those in need. He fed the 5,000. He did whatever he could to meet them where they were at. God said, don't send them away. Jesus said, do not send them away to get food. I want to meet them where they are at, right here and right now. And what you need to hear this morning is that God wants to meet you where you are at. God wants to meet you where you are at, no matter where you are at. In order to have compassion this morning, is in order to really set this, ser this series off right, to ser set this series off well, we need to experience God's compassion ourselves before we can ever experience it for other people. There has to be a groaning within our hearts that says, Lord, I need your compassion now. And once we experience that, then we can, we, we can minister to others to, to, to experience that compassion as well. The whole idea behind the series is we want to be missions focused, but here's the thing. You can't truly understand the need of the people that we're trying to reach even outside of our own context in the world around our world if you don't truly experience the gospel message, the good news, the compassion that Jesus Christ has for you this morning. You have to experience it first. And so as I was preparing my message this week, and I was talking to a friend about it, I usually talk to, to Joe or a couple other people, I share my message with them and say, hey, what do you think? Rip it apart, pick it apart, help me know how I can best communicate this. One of my friends goes, Rob, I, I feel like you're putting the cart before the horse. He says, the people of the Bridge Church need to experience God's compassion in a powerful way that's beyond anything that you could ever do or preach about. And so we're going to do something a little bit different this morning. And I'm going to ask Justin to come forward and begin to play. Um, compassion is a deep sense of mourning over the suffering of someone else. Compassion is a deep sense of mourning over the suffering of someone else. We see this best portrayed in John chapter 11, verse 35. It's the shortest verse in all of Scripture. Do you know what it says? Jesus wept. He wept over the broken. He wept over the sick. He wept over those that were sinful. He wept over you, I believe. He still weeps over you. And you cannot truly experience or delve out compassion yourself until you've experienced it yourself. So 
So let me preach a little bit of hope to you this morning like Jesus did. Because of who Jesus was, it is our job to imitate who he is. Amen? It is not Pastor Rob's job. It is our job. Amen? I shouldn't be the only one preaching hope. It's your job to do the same. But let me preach a little bit of hope to you this morning. You may feel like you messed up. You may feel like you are still messed up. But I'm telling you, your Savior, your Father in Heaven, wants to draw you close to His heart. He wants to reach down into the mess that you are. In the book of Genesis, we see the story of Adam and Eve. And God gave them one job, didn't He? Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You had one job and you screwed it up. But what's crazy is God didn't break the relationship. How many relationships have you broken because someone else screwed up? God chose not to do that. Yes, there was punishment. Yes, there was things that they would have to deal with. Yes, there were consequences, but he was still with them. Just not to the same level that he was before. Because sin separates, doesn't it? It breaks the relationship. If you've ever sinned against somebody, you know what it's like to have that awkward tension, don't you? To have that awkward tension between the two of you because sin separates. And guess what? In the beginning, all of humankind was separated by sin. But here's the good news. Throughout the Old Testament, God was initiating with humanity. He was initiating with Israel. He was saying, listen, I still want to be in communion with you. And they would present sacrifices every time they sinned. They'd present a sacrifice and say, to, to say, God, here's a fragrant offering. I want to give this up for you because my relationship with you matters more than anything else. And eventually God realized this isn't working. They're not getting it in their hearts. They're not understanding what is supposed to happen inside of them. And all that's happening is they're presenting all these sacrifices on the outside, but the inward working isn't happening. And so he said, I'm going to send my son down of whom will enter their hearts. And Jesus would be the one last sacrifice for their sins. He would be the last sacrifice for your sins once and for all, that the Holy Spirit might come in and work in heart in your heart and work in you, that you might be transformed. I think there are some of you here today that needed to hear that. Whether it's for the first time or the third time or the fifth time or the eighth time or the hundredth time, you need to hear in this moment that Christ died for you. And this morning, if you feel like He's calling you. I would love for you, when I, in, a, in a moment here, I'm going to invite you to come forward to the altars and ask for forgiveness. And some of you guys, what do I got to, what do I got to ask? Because we all have to ask for forgiveness. The book of Romans says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You're messed up. I'm messed up. She's messed up, he's messed up, and we need God to enter into our lives that we might be transformed, amen? So if God's tugging on your heart right now, in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to come forward to the altar and receive that hope that Christ wants to give you. But also, I'm going to ask the prayer ushers to come forward. And, and if you want us to pray with you, you can just come grab our hands. We'll probably put your hands on your shoulders. It, it, it's going to take an act of courage. Some of you guys are going, I'm not going up in front of everybody. I can't do that. I'm telling you, the courage to do so will transform your life forever. But Jesus didn't just come to preach hope. He also healed the sick and the lame and the broken. And he cared for those in need. So the second thing we're going to do this morning can be found in the book of James. And we're going to just gonna put this on the screen so you don't need to turn there now. But in the book of James, chapter 5, it says this. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Let them what? Pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. It goes on, and, and, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. 
The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that, that you might be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is what? Powerful and effective. So here's the deal. Over the last month, we've had a number of people dealing with sickness. We've had a number of people dealing with illness and trial and brokenness and pain. And the Lord of hosts wants to minister to you this morning. As it says earlier on that passage, it says, Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. We don't typically do this, okay? This is something that we're just beginning to do as a church. Um, let me be completely transparent with you. This is a first for Pastor Rob. But well, this morning, I have oil to anoint you with if you want to come forward and ask for prayer for healing. You can kneel at the altar and we'll come and pray with you and pray for you. That you might receive God's compassion in your life. And most importantly, His healing. It's going to take courage. It's going to take a lot more than, than many of you thought you were going to come to church with today. But I'm telling you, it's going to be worth it. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm about to, anoint, uh, to invite you to come forward. But as I, as I prepared this message this morning, I, I felt like there were just some words that God was placing on my heart that someone in this room needs to hear in one regard or another this morning. So with every head bowed and every eyes closed, I just want you to hear these words. Do not fear. All throughout the Gospels, Jesus said, do not fear. You are enough. You may feel inadequate this morning, but God is telling you, you are enough. I've placed my Imago Dei in you, my image in you. You are forgiven. You are saved by grace. You've been set free. You've been set free. Heavenly Father, we love you. And God, as we do something a little bit different this morning, I pray in faith that you're going to do something great. As some of us are going to be called by your Holy Spirit to, to make ourselves uncomfortable. God, you're going to grow our faith in ways that we never could have imagined. So Lord, I pray for courage for those that need to come forward. I pray for faith that they would believe that they would be healed. I pray repentance over their hearts and their lives. As I pray for repentance for myself now, Lord, I'm just as screwed up as the rest of them. Even, even recently, Lord, I pray a prayer of repentance for my lack of faith in so many areas. Lord, we need you now. And if, we're gonna, if we believe that you're real, then we've got to act like it. So this morning, I pray for faith and courage and healing for relationships mended, for unforgiveness and bitterness to be um, thrown away, Lord. God, you want to do something powerful this morning. I know that. And I believe that. And so this morning, God, we just pray in faith for you to move. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray.